We are live. <laughs> we are there. We are there. Hey, everybody. Santee and Mitch Herod. Glad to be here. you from the Arizona Ghost Raiders channel. And How we doing? Just, just Mitch from Jackson. There you go. Mitch Herod, just Mitch Herod from Jackson, Jackson, Missouri, not Mississippi. That's right. Um, That's right. Yeah. Uh, Mitch is with the St. Louis Iron Mountain Railroad. If any of you have not met him before, uh, he's joining us today to tell us a little bit about how he got started in doing this gunfight hobby. Um, and currently, Mitch, uh, every Saturday, is robbing a train as the character Jesse James. Why don't you tell him a little bit about that real quick while I uh, figure out this whole YouTube thing, Okay. I turn it over to you, Mitch. You got the you got the con. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, as uh, if you've never seen the episode on the Ghost Riders about the uh, train robbery in Missouri, I believe that's the title of it, or close to it. Um, I, uh, I I've been playing the part or the role of Jesse James for about the last uh, what five years now, um, and uh, at any rate, I kind of got drafted into it. I don't know how I ended up doing it. I. I was over in Jackson one day, and I happened, and I'd been on the train before, but that had been many, many years ago. And uh, they had a number to call, and I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna. I've gotten back into my, I've gotten back into my old six gun stuff, and I think that I want to be a gun hand. I want to be one of the robbers on the train, and so I made a phone call, talked to the gal named Elaine. And uh, Elaine said, you just come on over, do a ride along and see what you think. And I'm thinking, well, I've talked to Santee and I've. And uh, and, wow. And at any rate, um, I didn't know if it was going to be real, uh, real uh, Hollywood costuming or just whatever you have in your closet costuming or. It is going to be like what uh, Santee does there in Tucson with the uh, certainly period correct stuff. So I went along that day and met all the uh, key players like Milford the Marshal and uh, uh, the rest of the, the guys that were robbing the train. Sometimes Milford has a deputy, sometimes he doesn't. But I found, you know, showed up and took the ride and said, yeah, count me in, I'll do it. And I've been doing it ever since. And I... I didn't call and say, gee, I, you know, uh, just give me a part as a under five or anything like that. Just, uh, <laughs> you know, just let me, uh, let me shoot my guns there. And sure enough. Uh, you should some... never have taught you that term. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, okay. You just use it all the time now, Mitch. Just got to stop. Yeah. He's got to, ladies and gentlemen, real quick. <laughs> Mitch used a term called under five, which is in, in television in, in TV terms, that is somebody who has less than five lines. <laughs> <laughs> he keeps using it. It's a, yeah, so. it's just really awkward at Thanksgiving, I think, when you say, you know, I'll, I'll take right. under five slices of turkey. Is, it's, <laughs> it's enough. It's enough. You know, you overdo it. Anyway, I, 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 I. Um, I'm going to show a couple of pictures uh, real quick of Mitch over at the train, just so you guys have an idea. Uh, a lot of you know him already. Ooh, look at that. Hey, technology. Hold on. Okay, so this is a picture of of our lovely Mitch Herod at the train. Um, yeah, I snapped that yesterday, as a matter of fact. So that's from yesterday. Okay, all right. So uh, the train stops at this little village that you guys do your shootout at. Is that where this is right now? Is it the village? Oh, yeah. That's yeah, the fire okay. in the background behind me, that's that's what we light up. And uh, they do the s'mores and uh, roasted marshmallows and whatever else they want. But they also have that table that you see in the background there is full of watermelon. And oh, very that, nice. Until that goes out of season. And, you know, Walmart is going to run it till it can't run anymore. So it's they're not gonna watermelon water anymore. They're going to have watermelon for a while. Um, this is just a shot of people milling around. That little building to the right-hand side with a walk there is that's the that's the church. Okay, all right. Well, that's that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, it looks like you had a, you guys had a pretty good turnout, even beating all the heat, as it were. But yeah. um, that's pretty neat. It looks like a lot of kids there. That's good. Right. 
Um, real quick, while we're here, I'm going to show a picture of Mitch back when he kind of got started. When I first met him, now you probably have seen this picture on the channel at some point. I think I did it in a video. Um, this was one of Mitch's first get-ups as Jesse James. Uh, there's nothing really wrong with this outfit from a from a gunfight perspective. And we've talked in the past about how from a living history or a reenactor perspective, uh, it would not be as appropriate. However, you know, he's not doing that. He's basically doing gunfight shows at a train and uh, holding up bad guy. Now, Mitch is a fast draw artist as well as a gun spinner. So if you notice, he has a Buscadero rig on his belt. Uh, well, I guess it's not on his belt. It's his belt. His belt is a Buscadero rig. Um, that's a throwback from the 50s and 60s and 40s, actually, uh, of the belts that they had back then. Um, a lot of people ask me when they get started, is this the right kind of belt? And I tell them, look, it, not, not for reenactment or living history, but if you're doing gunfight shows and that's the only thing available, by God, get it. You know? And um, it has a lot of pluses, too. Why don't you tell us about that, Mitch? What, what do you do with that belt? Well, those belts, I, you know, I, they came pretty plain. I went down to the, the store where I bought it, and uh, he dressed it up for me a little bit. I've got, I've got that very belt right here. Uh, but uh, basically, he put some conchos on it for me and uh, dressed up the center little strap around the holster, which used to show in t movies and TV uh, uh, a lot of uh, buckles and things like that. But uh, the idea behind the rig itself is that it puts, it places the gun within immediate reach. It's just about at your wrist. The butt of the gun is right at your wrist. So getting the getting the gun out of the holster is an extremely easy proposition. So it lends itself well. In fact, it was the first egg that uh, was kind of available at the, during those times. Right. And that's what Arvo Ajala sold the studios on. I can, he said, basically, as uh, I've heard, he can, he can teach any star to fast draw a gun without a great deal of trouble or issue. So, okay, boom, and we're back. Yeah. So, uh, some of you who may not know who Arvo Ajala is, he, um, if you ever watch the intro to the TV show Gunsmoke, and Matt Dillon draws against a guy and beats him. Well, that guy he's shooting against is Arvo Ojala. There you go. There's the rig. Uh, Arvo was a gunsmith. He was a, a holster maker, and he was a gun coach. He taught people how to do a lot of the stuff out there. He also basically uh, entrepreneured the first metal-lined rig uh, that, that a lot of them used in those movies. So in, in essence, um, I don't think it's bad to get that if you're doing a gunfight show. I think if you're doing living history, then you got to be a little bit more careful. However, you can, if you have that rig already, you can actually take the, can you show the holster again one more time for a favor? Sure. It's Spanish for those of you who didn't know. Yeah. So you can actually unsnap that uh, holster, I think. Can you? Is it? No. Not that uh, one? These are some. Oh, okay. A lot of the ones I've seen are actually, uh, you can take them out of the, of the loop and put them around a normal belt. Well, um, this is the only thing that keeps you from doing that. That and the rivets are that he put. The rivets are okay. Yeah, a lot the of them I see Chicago is. screws. So yours is it yours is, is there forever. So okay, all right. Okay, so I stand corrected. Mitch's is not capable of doing that, but a lot of the other ones you can remove the holster and put it on a plain belt if that's all you have to get started. Yeah. Um, and of course you can wear what, what kind of belt he's wearing if you're getting started too. It also depends on just really what you're trying to achieve. I think that Hollywood, uh, has a lot of impact on the Western culture, uh, as we know it today. So when you go to a show, when somebody who doesn't know anything goes to a show and sees somebody with a Buscadero rig, I don't think they're going to sit there and go, mm, I don't know if they had that belt back then. I think they're just happy to see the show then you can always educate them later on, that kind of thing. But when you're getting started, don't if you don't have the money for it, don't don't say, "Look, I can't do it. I can't buy the really expensive rig. Let me. I'm not going to do it at all." Then no, we want you to do it. Once you get out there and do it, if it means buying a Buscadero rig for living history, 
there will be somebody out there that will correct you and help you get the right thing, hopefully. So, all right. Well, you know, our gunfight show, our robbery there on the on the train. And robbery. Yeah, the, the, the robbery we do, you know, uh, is one that people come to see because you can't see a gunfight show anywhere else in the state of Missouri that I'm aware of uh, or I've even heard of let alone around this part of Missouri uh, that's open to the public. You know, Six Flags at one time in St. Louis had one, but that's long since vanished. Right. But the, but the people that come see the show, uh, they realize that they're going to see some Western, and that's the key word, Western characters. So their expectation is they're going to have a cowboy hat on, some boots and a gun and a, you know, and a holster. And right. You know, that's what they come to see. They've seen it on television. They've seen it in the movies. And when you come in dressed like that kind of thing, and just like they've seen in those uh, shows, they're they're happy with that. They're yeah, you know, and that's great. Because I'm, I'm not trying to, uh, and I may have, if I said it incorrectly, I apologize. I'm not trying to blast what he does, because I, I did it when I started out, too. Um, I... I think that anything that brings attention to the Western genre is, is important and we got to do it, you know, um, however you want to dress, it's just as long as you're out there and you're doing it, you have the opportunity to learn more from watching the channel or from watching other channels and spreading the history. If you want now you, when you started out with that outfit, things have changed since you, uh, since you started there. Right. I mean, you don't, you don't wear, the same leather vest anymore do you you i mean the vest you have on right now is actually a different yeah. vest than you started yeah. with isn't it this is a, a brown and it probably looks black but it's a brown herringbone vest i bought at wild wild uh, west mercantile and so plus i, I plus I, I i i lost the uh, lost the wristwatch <laughs> and gained a pocket watch yeah, I'm carrying right. a pocket watch now. So yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just one of those things that we, we've all kind of got into doing because we're just, as time has gone on, you know, you start out with what I kind of had already. I did have a canvas duster. I did have a, an 1873 Bianchi uh, gun gun rig. Uh, it was not a fast draw rig. I did have an, um, an Ernie Hill fast draw double Hollywood rig made back way back at the top of the 80s. But uh, my first actual weekend out there was uh, a mix of uh, my little Bianchi as a cross draw uh, and my and another little holster that I bought at a local gun shop that was more of a, a sash uh, shooters uh, rig that you'd see at a that you'd see at an end of the trail or our uh, cowboy action shoot. So it was a mix up, but it yeah. was my, my first show. So I had fun. That's good. We have a um, Richard Brubaker, who I've known for a very long time. Back in Yuma, I've known him. Uh, he was with a, a group called the Fallbrook Outlaws out of California. They were a very good group. Um, I guess they've disbanded or maybe moved on and they're no longer, he says. Um, and they were popular. The Fallbrook Outlaws were one of those groups. I think that the first time I went to Yuma, and I actually posted a picture of it a second ago. The first time I went to Yuma, I I did have on Wild West Mercantile, actually, clothing. But I had a tan vest, tan pants, and a tan hat. I, I tell you, I looked like, I mean, I, I feel like I look like a piece of caramel or something. I don't know. You were monochromatic there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't win the costume competition. I didn't even place. In fact, they laughed at me when I walked up. But... Um, I have since learned to vary the wardrobe a little bit. And um, as you, the real thing is, even as I say in the channel, and even as, you know, Mitch is proof over here, as you go along, you pick up things. You start thinking, well, you know what? I kind of like that look. I I, I want to I wanna replicate that look. You know what? I kind of want a pocket watch. Or, well, guess what? I want a different hat band for my hat. All these kinds of things are things and steps in the right direction when you're, when you're going to be doing the old west history stuff you know you want to you want to represent as it were and you are doing that let me show some pictures while we're talking of how you're representing i'm pretty amazed 
at the millions of dollars you've spent lately. Uh, no, I'm kidding. It's not millions. <laughs> the millions? It's millions. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me show you. There's a picture of – that's a picture of me in the front there and Arizona Red in the back. Um, that is not the tan outfit. Actually, this is about midway through my uh, – my uh, transition into into being more period correct. The hat is a Gus Crease hat, which is not a bad choice. And everything I'm wearing for the most part is pretty much period correct, I believe. Um, I'm not sure the Gus Crease hat is for that for Arizona. But anyway, let's go on here and show Mitch. That's what Mitch looks like now. So you can see he's gone. He shed the gray shirt and the bandana. Now he's he's really rocking the Jesse James look. Uh, he's got a nice vest on. He's got a pocket watch. He's got a microphone. Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, that microphone. Comes Is that real. 1880s, that microphone, Mitch? Yeah, it, it, genuine, genuine. I, okay. I bought that at a, at a very old garage sale. Yeah. <laughs> he's wearing a puff tie with a, with a tie pit, tie clip, a tie pin, rather, and a... Um, a basically a boss of the plane style hat. Uh, some people call it a white Earp hat. Yeah. Some people call it a Virgil Earp hat, whatever you want to call it. But it's a it's a flat crowned hat with well, it's sort of domed uh, with a oh, flat brim. Yeah. yeah, it's got a slight dome to it. There's another shot of him in a different vest. So you can see he's oh, and look, he's wearing a different tie too. He's just yeah. he's just all stylish right now. Look at that. <laughs> well, looking good know, there. We we've talked. Every uh, well dressed outlaw should be right. That's right. Well, what they're all wearing. This is one of our 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 guys there. One of our fellow robbers. This guy named Dave that plays Cole Younger. And you know, Dave was new to the whole whole thing, and and, and he got asked to uh, join the gang by Elaine uh, because we had some weekday charter bus charter tours and buses that were coming in for a train robbery. And of course I'm working, I can't be there. And there's only a couple of people that could, and he was one of them. And so, and I kind of gave him some, uh, a little guidance and things like that. And I said, well, here's the guns you need. Here's the, here's what I'd say you need in terms of your holsters. I said, they're not extremely expensive. You can spend a lot more than you're going to, or, you know, if you elect to buy these. I said, but, uh, you know, how much you spend is up to you. But I said, let me just point you in the right direction. So, and he really has. He, uh, man, he's got, he just bought him uh, an open top. And, um, you know, it's just, he just kind of really having a great time with it. And, uh, but, yeah, it's, it really, if you love what you're doing and you love the hobby, you're going to spend some money on it. It's just like, just about anything. Okay. Yeah. You're absolutely right. It is. Um, and I'm glad that you, you know, I, first of all, just so it's known, I never told him to go out and buy this stuff. He did this on his own volition. I, um, I only ever supported him in his, in his plight. Uh, it's, a uh, it's, it's been fun for him. I think it's been fun for you. Uh, has it, I think you told me it's fun. And, and like I said, it's not that I'm breaking the bank because because I uh, there's just the difference between the, your uh, the, st the thing you do there and the thing I do here is that whole period is the period versus Hollywood kind of kind of appeal and that look. And so I'm not I don't have to worry about having an actual band collar shirt that I have to buy an extra collar for to put a collar on. The, the riders on the train really don't have any, any idea that's true. The riders don't understand or realize that there were no belted pants back in those days. You wore suspenders. I don't wear suspenders. So <laughs> there's a lot of things that I can get away with simply because I'm wearing what they expect to see me in. So. I've made what I think are good purchases. I think the vest, if, if you're going to make one purchase and you've got a pair of jeans and a nice shirt, the one thing that you can buy is a vest that really spices, that really ups the game just with that 
forty dollars. You right know, there. that's that's a really good point. Yeah, it is. And and that's a that's one of those things. The nice thing too about it is it has pockets so you can put stuff in it if you need to, which is a, a function of a vest. But the other thing too is that you can justify jeans because they actually did exist back then. Um it says it right on the Levi's tab, even though they weren't as mainstream as as we think they are, or as you know, you see in the seventies westerns. It's still, it's still. I'd rather see somebody in jeans than somebody in pleated khaki pants out there. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, just, just. I'd rather see in jeans because at least jeans I can justify. You know. So you're yeah. right. The vest does make a the vest all, all the. Uh, and for anyone, all the people I know wear vests. What? It's not that you have to get into it on the cheap, but I'm just saying that. You don't have to have a budget just for a wardrobe unless you want to spend the money. We got a new guy uh, named John, and John is just getting into this. He went out and bought a gun, and he ordered a holster a rig like like this that, that I have and uh, has not yet gotten it in. But I'm letting him borrow that SAS uh, rig that I have uh, so he doesn't have to... Well, so to be able to do it, uh, you know, carry a gun without sticking it in his pants or, or his belt. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's he's really excited about it and having a good time with it. And uh, um, he's going to start spending some money. He, he was talking about, well, I'm going to buy this and that and the other thing. And I told him, I said, look, you can spend any money you want to, and that's up to you. It's your, it's your money. I, however, I said, you can always get a nice pair of $20 pants at Walmart for our for our purposes uh, or go go or go to uh, go to Amazon and buy and buy them on that for 20 bucks I said uh, take the crease out of them if they've got one and I said uh, boom and you can buy it in any color and as a consequence he's got a bunch of those already colored pants but you know I think he I think he's just in that frame of mind well you know I think I want a period pair of pants and I said well you know that's yeah if you want to do that just go right ahead but i think you simply don't have to i said you know all you got to do is find that comfortable shirt that you think looks great get a vest to go with it get you a cowboy hat or two that you like a pair a couple pair of boots if you've already got them which he does he's from texas and uh and at any rate uh you know you're there. you're good to go yeah, yeah. okay all right you can hear me right still mm -hmm. All right, good. I just did that banner thing that we have trouble with in the pre-show. We're having mic problems, but everything's working okay now, right? Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so that's great. That so, so what you're doing is basically you're taking what you learned and you're passing it on to people who might be more interested. Yeah, so it wasn't that long that John got his gun that he, switched, he swapped out the grips. I mean, he just, like a week later, he said, oh, good. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. Well, um, amazing that uh, they the gun he got was, I, I'm not sure exactly, <laughs> frankly, it was a piano model gun, but it has an octagonal barrel and in four and three quarter, but the rest of the gun is, you know, there are is blued, blued, uh, blued gun with a case hardened frame, but it had plastic grips like a Colt, a two piece, uh, you know, two piece uh, grips and uh, they didn't fit very well. And I didn't really realize that the first time I, he showed me the gun and I handled it and it occurred to me. Uh, but um, well, let's let's talk about that for a second. So since we just sort of that was a nice segue, by the way, into guns. So uh, Mitch is going to hold up his gun. I'm going to hold up my gun. Boy, they look the same, except Mitch is much prettier than mine is because <laughs> Mitch has engraving on his. Yeah. Uh, mine does not. Mine is a Uberti imported by Cimarron Arms, I believe. And his is a Pieta imported by... It's actually a Taylor's. What's that? It's a Taylor's. And it's okay. got the full ivory grip on it. Yeah. Now it's a one piece grip. I have seen them with a, you know, a two, with a, a two piece grip, but yeah. all the guns that I do have are one piece grips, whether they're the small ivory or the wood. So. Right. So the two piece grips came out later in the period and not that much later, but uh, it, yeah, they, they really were in through the Civil War up until the uh, starting of the West and even further on uh, the one piece grip. Um, 
Yeah, Mitch knows because on the grip video I did this weekend, the grip and holster video, these grips are from Arizona Custom Grips, and I had to adjust them because I have an early model 1873 uh, six gun here. Uh, it is the what they what they call the they call it the black powder frame because it doesn't have the plunger over here. It has that little screw right yeah. there to release the cylinder. Um, however, they're all black powder guns. I mean, uh, they call it the black powder frame. But anyway, um, his has got the plunger, right? Yours is plungery. Oh, yeah. all my guns are plunger guns, so there, there's no no screw there. Okay. Uh, well, the the benefit to his gun over my gun is that if he gets a backed out primer, he can pop that cylinder out with a push of a button. I have to get a screwdriver to back mine to get mine out of there. Um, yes, mine's more historically accurate in some respects because I don't believe the plunger one came out until the 1890s, but it doesn't matter. It's not important. The important thing is, is that the gun is, uh, these guns are not that expensive. That's what I'm getting to. A lot of people ask me, where do I get one? They make versions of these with a brass backstrap. This is a backstrap. And a grip frame, uh, grip frame and backstrap. They make it all in brass, with a what, what looks like a painted black um, frame. What finished cylinder barrel and uh, yeah, yeah, and and those things are under four hundred dollars, right? Am I right about that? Uh, I well, right right now, little, Mark is a little inflated, but yeah, they should be. Okay. Yeah, they yeah. were. They it's, were. They were. Yeah. They were about 380, if I remember. Right, exactly. Right. Academy actually had some of them. So. Right, you can do that. Now, Mitch's gun is engraved. It's laser engraved by uh, Pieta or Taylor. I'm not sure which. Hey, wait a minute, that's not real. <laughs> hey, look out now. Look out. That's a, that's a real Ripley gun. <laughs> it's a Ripley gun. It's got a seam going right down the center of it. Yeah, See, it's just like Red Dead Redemption right there. That's the gun. <laughs> So those of you who play Red Dead, please don't be offended. It's not an offensive thing. It's just one of the minor things they, they kind of messed up on, but it's, it's okay. Was they I, got the rest of well, I was mean. I'm sorry. I apologize. That was just heartless. I'm going to have a drink. Um, anyway, what I was saying is if you guys are getting started, the probably the most expensive things that you're going to have to get would be the gun and the gun rig. It you can is. get holsters, or uh, you can get hats on the cheap. You can get boots. Yeah. You can't get really. You can't get boots on the cheap, but still, they're not. They're not that much of an expense, but the gun is, you know. And a lot of people will buy the uh, percussion models, and then wish they hadn't bought the percussion models because they're hard to load blanks in, you know. And then later on, you can swap the cylinders out for conversion cylinders if you want. But it, it, whatever whatever works for you is what I'm saying. You know, you do what you, do what's best for you and your your wallet. You didn't well, have great guns to start, did you? No. The, well, the the truth is uh, when I I bought these. In fact, in fact, the, these are stainless Pieta Frontiers. Uh, I got two. I got two pair of these. It just four and three quarter pair, and then I got a five and a half inch pair. These are stainless guns. And these are the first purchases that I made. And yeah, I mean, the, the gun is the bump. It's the original hurdle to get over. Because a lot of people out there really like the whole cowboy thing. But when it comes time to do it, you can't do it with a 1911. And you can't do it with a Glock 19. And so, or even a Model, model 19 uh, Smith. Uh, so yeah, you have to have the cowboy gun or uh, uh, Smith and West Model 3 Schofield or something and that's even more expensive than these guns only because they are something completely different and very unique but certainly period correct however Hollywood has done its number on this gun because there were so many of them that they adapted this gun to most every western star you'll ever see or have seen and these are just the gun of Hollywood. That's just how it is. So, um, but these are the ones that I started with. Since then, I have, I have uh, gotten a few more. I tell you the story behind the little replica gun thing here is because we've <laughs> we've had people uh, come to the train who want to help us rob the train, or they want to be alone. Uh, 
uh, with Milford. There you go. There you go. Beautiful, beautiful work. Beautiful work. I did that because I think I recognize the last name of somebody in this uh, in the stream who who actually, if it's the same person I'm thinking of, uh, he invented that holster. So we'll see. Anyway, go ahead. So tell us, tell us, tell us about Mitch Milford. Well, this this is well no someone who wanted to, to uh, get on board the train that day. They were excited about being part of the robbery or they just believed they could do it. So uh, I, I bought a couple of these replica guns so that they would have something to, to, to wear. So we have something at the train for people to have done a little bit of a costume as long as they're not wearing shorts. <laughs> so, right, know. right. They well, that's really cool that you can do that if somebody and you know what the good thing is, is that that person may decide to come back and actually join up and volunteer because they enjoyed it so much. So that's good. Yeah, we have guys in our group that actually don't like to shoot guns, uh, but they were a dummy gun like that. Well, John is John's one of those people the new, one of the new guys from Texas. He and his wife both actually work there. She works in the station at the counter there. Uh, for concessions, and John is just an all, all around. He does a little uh, grounds work and stuff like that. He robs the train. He's he's retired, so he's got plenty of time. But at any rate, uh, at any rate, uh, you know, he and his wife showed up, and I really believe that exactly, that's exactly how it happened. But he's one of the few that show up and are excited about it, and then actually come back. <laughs> so. You know, right. because sometimes people will get excited the day they're there. Oh, my goodness, I want to do this. Oh, my, I'll see you next week. And Well, I think, they look, I think they look at the bigger picture. And this is kind of what we're talking about today. I think they look at the big picture and go, how much is this going to cost me to do this for free for fun? And they look and they go, oh, my gosh, a gun is $450. I can't do that. Um, you know. Well, and, in, addition, uh, yeah, in addition to... Not only that, but now, well, now I got to go buy a, a gun rig, and that's at least going to cost you 115 bucks, 125 dollars, unless you get right. one cheap, on the cheap, and someone that you just it happens to fit you. Uh, but you know, uh, so um, that's that's the one. I guess the, the gun is the most prohibited piece that you cost prohibitive piece that you run into for most people. We had we have one guy uh, who who doesn't do with us anymore, but um, he used to he worked for about a year and a half with us, and but he didn't actually have a single action. He had a judge, so but oh it, my shot, God. it shot forty five. So uh, well, yeah, and a four ten shotgun shell. I mean, right? He didn't shoot that, did he? Oh, because no, Marshall Milford can't get up after that. That's right. So, uh, oh, so you know what? Let's. That's the thing. That um, there's some really great people in here, including my brother Steve. I know many of you don't know. I actually was. Uh, I have brothers and sisters. I know it's weird, but uh, my brother Steve's in the in the chat right now. So uh, you have heard him lately. He's been German guards. Uh, he's been. Uh, gosh, I can't remember how many voiceovers he's done for me. So appreciate it, Steve. Love you. Um, I'm going to show some blanks now because we're starting to talk about blanks. Uh, if I can figure out how to do this again, because that's it. Okay, here we go. Blanks are a big thing that we got to talk about because they are an expense. Um, they are an expense now. They they didn't. I mean, there's two ways to do it: either you make them or you buy. Them. Right. So these are an example of what Mitch and uh, what Mitch and I, we both make these. These are homemade brass. Sorry, they're all brass. These are homemade blanks with floral foam, black powder and real primers. These are easy to make. They're cheap. If you notice behind the actual cartridges, you'll see these you'll see floral foam with holes in it. Basically, once you put the powder in, you press the 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 brass casing through that foam and then you press that foam down into the case which creates um a safe projectile a safe projectile that sounds like something that's that, that's like jumbo shrimp isn't it 
Yes, it's, it's a safe effect of because when it comes out, it burns up on the barrel and it never gets out past the barrel. It does. It, yeah, and it does create give it compression. So when you're when right. you're putting it down in there, that little exacto blade you see there in the picture, that handle on the on the right side there, that's that's what I use to to push that down in there as tight as I can get the floral foam. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of how that works. And I have a video out on that. I'm going to update that video because uh, it's pretty old, long in the tooth now, but I don't think the information has changed much. But there's some options out there for other things that I can talk about. The other blank that Mitch first started with is this one pictured here, which is a crimped blank. This is also very popular and it doesn't require floral foam because you're actually crimping the mouth of that brass. Um, so that what happens is when it gets fired, it opens up like a flower and the powder comes out. So it does the same thing as the floral foam. The trouble is you can't reuse this one. Once you fired it, it's done. It's, it's a gone. Running, so. Right. And don't you give those to kids as souvenirs? I do. That, that's yeah. the upside to this. I mean, I, I really, uh, as I reflect on it, you know, at, at one time I thought, well, you know, I really need to save some bucks on this because it's, can be kind of expensive because we were going through at least 10 to 15 rounds every Saturday and because we were shooting two guns uh, at that time. And we had for since I got started, it was always a pair of pistols. Marshall, uh, Milford shoots a pair and I shoot a pair and whoever else would shoot. If they Wait, had. you're shooting fruit? I thought you guys were shooting at each other. Yeah, well, <laughs> right, right, right. Well, occasionally we get a pineapple, and that's the easy target. And okay, of course, yeah, those are pretty easy. You don't get that before they cut it up. But, the hard anyway, part is shooting the lime and getting it in the coconut before you drink it all up. That's the ultimately the most difficult of all of it. But, you yeah, might, I get you. You might even be a songwriter. But, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's the one thing that I can give to kids uh, that they can take home with them that they don't have to buy at the station right. or that or something they were not expecting one bit. I mean, here here Jesse James comes around, you know, opens his gun up, rotates the cylinder, and pops out a case for him and say, here, here's that thing that goes bang. And that's what makes all the noise. And they're just thrilled to pieces to have that little memento that they got at the train. Now with my with 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 the stuff that you make and that I make, we can't give that away because it's reusable brass and this is not reusable. Right. Um, you know, BJ Blaskovich Gaming uh, mentioned that you got to be careful putting your hand near the blanks. You know, we were talking about blanks and I didn't even put any kind of uh, disclaimer up there to say, guys, blanks can kill. I think we all on this channel have, have learned that. Not that anybody's been killed on the channel. Uh, has yeah. anybody been killed? Right. Dirty Dan shot a lot of people. No, no, nobody's been killed. We're good. Um, but you got to be careful. Blanks, even though it's crimped, even though it's got floral foam in it, the powder and the gases coming out of there can punch holes in skin. They can put eyes out. They can hurt people. So you got to really be careful when you're dealing with blanks. Treat them like you would a, a, a live projectile. So now here are some other blanks that are also crimped. These are what they call five-in-ones. They look a lot like the previous blank. A five-in-one blank is what they've been using in Hollywood for probably, gosh, yeah, okay. 60 years, would you say? Maybe, maybe more? Well, they go in lever guns. They go in your single-action guns. Uh, anything yeah. So the, yes, yeah with a straight I believe the five, the five relates to 3840, 4440, 45 Colt. Um, yeah. 45 long. Uh, let see. Wait. 410, I'm missing one, 45, 44, 44 Magnum too, I believe, oh, okay. or maybe just 38. Either way, there's your five. Uh, a lot of them previous were three and ones, which means they just did 38, 40, 44, 40, and 45. Uh, and that's what all that, if you look at the, sh the shell, that's what you notice, all that tapering is for. Um, and these are also throwaway guns. As a matter of fact, I didn't tell you this, Mitch, but over at Mescal, studios they've uh dan silva has been digging up and finding five and one blanks he thinks they go all the way back to monty walsh or even further 
or, yeah. or maybe even more recent. So that's pretty cool that they just they littered back then too, is what I'm saying. Yeah, amazing. Wow. Okay, and then these, lastly, it are plastic blanks that are really hard to get. Mitch and I have been talking about getting some. What happens with these is they are contained as well, like the crimped ones. These are also throwaway blanks. Uh, they're scored. You can't really see the top, but the top is scored in a cross, just slightly scored, so that just like the crimp blank blanks, when it fires, it, it opens up in a flower and releases the powder. Those are, I believe, are those shotgun primers? Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. okay. Louder bang, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, so for some reason, that's what they decided to go with. And I figured the reason behind it is because the bottom of the case would be, uh, the bottom of the, the plastic part of the case would just be probably too weak uh, to handle the handle the shot. So uh, with a regular prime primer in the plastic, that might be a little dangerous as far as the back, the gas is coming back. Uh, I right. Guess so. right, right, right. Yeah, so those are blanks that when, when I grew up going to places like Six Gun Territory and even old, you know, when I was a kid, I went to old Tucson, but I don't remember if they used those. I think they probably did not use plastic blanks back then, but Six Gun Territory did. Uh, that that was in Florida. It's it's unfortunately it's gone, but they have revamped it. They brought it back anyway. Um, but I remember one of the gunfighters giving me one of those, just like you do to the kids, which is awesome. One of the gunfighters did that for me, and he gave me one of those blanks. In fact, my brother who's watching remembers going to Six Gun Territory with me. Hopefully, he remembers. I don't have dementia yet, do you? Next year, maybe. We'll see. Anyway, <laughs> but. Uh, I still have one of those blanks and uh, I tell you, it's what you do and what I do, but what you do specifically because you are out there every Saturday for the most part uh, throughout the year, you're out there and that one blank you give to that one kid could be the next Santee, could be the next Mitch Herod, you know, and they could be so interested in it that they do what we do. They're the next generation and they carry it on. Now that's the, that's the idea we're trying to get across, right? Right, exactly. You know, that's that's uh, that's kind of funny. The story behind my interest in the the cowboy thing and the six gun, the fast draw, the the, the falling in love with the with that gun. It's it's well, I've I've always thought it's a beautiful piece of Victorian sculpture. It's just it, aesthetically, it's one of the most pleasing pleasing guns you can ever look at. It it you just it just screams we you know what that is it's a it's a cowboy pistol it you it's ubiquitous i mean it just you don't have to say what it is it's a cowboy gun and so i fell in love with that and the whole western movie and tv show and you know for some reason there's my dad who is uh who uh was a marine was not a a, a guy who was a hunter he was not that guy he you know, so guns were not a, we didn't have a big gun case at the house. I had some cousins that did, but my dad didn't. Uh, he didn't go hunting. I went hunting because he gave me a Model 06 Winchester uh, gallery pump. Uh, his mother liked uh, uh, squirrels and rabbits, so I'd go out and shoot those on Saturday for him. And I don't think he meant to shoot them. I think he just liked them. Like, you know, you killing them was probably yeah. not what he wanted. You know, he wanted to keep them as pets. So good no. job, Mitch. Well, like that way, but 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 seriously, you know, I I don't come from, I didn't come from a a, a home that, you know, was uh, let's go hunting son because that's just not what happened. I picked up on this on my own, and I really liked it, and I can't really point to any one thing that that took me in that direction, but but here I am today. So, giving those things away, to little kids, I, I just. I, I just think that for if if I were their age, wow, that would be so cool for some one of those guys that's actually performing to give me a piece of their work. And as one of those as one of those kids, I'm telling you right now, it is. Yeah, that's it. That's all of it right there. Yeah. You don't think to you it's a throwaway to them. It's it's opening a door. And you know, and, um, it was to me. You know. And I 
I came home with, with with an extra one last night, and and I thought, oh man, I could have given that away to some little guy. And you know, it's not just the little guy; it's just the little girls want one too. So, sure, you know, it, it really is, it really is amazing the the effects you have uh, on these kids in, in a positive way. On the other side, you know, it's kind of interesting if they're small enough, or and usually it's pretty if they're really young kids they're scared of that gun going bang and some 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 are afraid of you but that's normal that's okay you know yeah yeah we've we've had uh instances where i mean dirty dan is is roaming around on here somewhere i just saw his name but he can attest to the fact that you know you're at an event with a bunch of kids as soon as that gun fires about three seconds later you hear that (laughs) you know and the mom has to carry the kid out Cause it's loud and it's, it scares dogs and children. And, um, but the kids that are of age think it's the neatest thing and, um, whatever of age means, you know, well, at that age. I go um, and walk up to them and, and they don't have to ask me for one. I kind of look down the, down the car in the aisle and ah, there's a kid over here with his brother or there's a kid across the aisle from him. I think I'm just going to run around, around there and give them something. I, there was, when we were doing two guns, uh, you know, I could afford to, you know, I could take some out there at the, at the village and give them to them, but I wait till they're back on the train going home and give them out then. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure their folks realize that they're, they're spent blank, so they don't worry about that kind of a thing. Well, they, yeah, you can immediately tell it's, it's, well, it's burned up and charred and. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Put one of those in your belt. Yeah. Right. Exactly. You know, going back to six gun territory, I'm going to go back in time here a little bit. Um, And if my brother's still on, he'll remember this. But I had uh, my mom and I uh, were in an antique store in Florida. This is all in Florida when I grew up. And um, I saw a Buscadero rig. It was black and it was tooled and it was worn to heck. And it was probably twenty dollars. I don't know. I don't know. It was back in the eighties or seventies, and um, I put my fake gun in there and I wore it to Six Gun Territory, and my fake gun was very much like your Denix fake gun, so much that the gunfighters were like, "Is that a real gun?" And here I am, this like eleven-year-old kid, ten-year-old kid, and they're like, "Is that a real gun?" And they just it just blew them away, and they're like, "I want to see that gun." showed them the gun. They realized it was fake. And they said, that's the best fake I've ever seen. And I said, thanks. And I put it back in my holster. And then they gave me the blank. And, um, you know, it was me hanging out with the gunfighters Yeah. at age 10. That did it. I was already there. I was on the precipice of going full Old West. And then those gunfighters did it. Hopefully they're still alive. And uh, one day I'd like to meet them and thank them. But, uh, you know, it's that's that's maybe what you did to one of those kids. So that's awesome. I hope uh, so. The other thing that I tell you, my, my story is probably later on in life. I didn't get to go see a show like that when I was that age. But uh, one of the first guys I ever saw do fast, actual fast trial work was Jim Dunham. And this is 1980. And he came to Cape Girardeau uh, to do a, a show a gun handling show uh, and fast draw show. And Jim Dunham yeah, is, is a guy that maybe some do, some know, and some don't, but he's a, he's a prominent uh, figure in the, in, in the, in the uh, was a prominent figure in sport. He was also a gun coach in Hollywood and so on. He was based out of Durango, Colorado. He's no longer there, but at that time he was. And he was the first one I ever saw outside a television set actually handle pair of uh, nickel colts like he knew what he was doing and he just it was just inspired me and uh, so when I got mine I, I, I he actually I actually let uh, he said I actually asked him if he'd let me you know hold the gun and he said sure and I cocked the hammer and it was like oh my god this is just so unbelievable it's just like that was the gateway drug I said that that was it so that was the so gateway there, right there. Like, uh, who does your gun work and i've got to get mine to work like this you know so you know um one of my uh, you're you're getting me going here one of one of mine when i was a kid i was in cub scouts 
I was a wee below, whatever the hell that is. And uh, that's, I think, as far as I got. I was anti-establishment even back then. But anyway, I remember we went to this this show, and it was this fast draw artist. And he was up there popping balloons and stuff. I can't remember the guy's name. I wish I did. But he called me up to the stage. Here I, I walk up my little wee below outfit, and he makes me hold a balloon, and he shoots it out of my hand. And um, I, I, I just wish at that point – I wasn't as into, I was really young. I was probably eight or something like that. But um, those guys, you just don't see them very much, you know? I mean, they're still around. They're probably in wheelchairs now, shooting from wheelchairs. But uh, um, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> they yeah. tip their wheelchair back and they fire a shot off and they rock back. <laughs> but um, it's, it, I, I just hope everybody has that story of what did it for them. You know, that's kind of neat. Um, I love it. Jim Dunham is – Mitch and I talk a, a lot during the week, and um, I mentioned to him once that Jim Dunham is one of those people who can sit there and tell a story, and you're not bored by the story because the guy is spinning his guns the entire time, but he's doing it right by his hips. So it's like he's just – it's like he's doing this thing with his thumbs, whatever that's called. And And – and you're you have to be engaged because you're watching this amazing stuff he's doing from the shoulders down while he's talking and telling you the story. It's right. Am I right? No, he is. He he's just an absolutely incredible. He's, what a showman that guy is. I tell you, he can tell the whole story just with using his guns and 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 speaking. So it was like watching a you know watching a movie. You know him tell the. the him say all the lines and and demonstrate what the, everything means with his guns. So yeah, it was really incredible. Yeah, I'd really like to meet him one day. He's uh, he seems like the real the real deal, and he's just so good. You know, um, you remind me a lot of him actually because of the ease that you spin your guns, and you do it every weekend on the train now, right? I mean, yeah, uh, do you get a lot of kids whose eyes get really big, or when they see you yeah. do that? I'll walk down the aisle and I'll be, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm here to do the gun handling and the, and my young assistant here behind me will collect your money. So, you know, kind of thing. So uh, I'm the guy with the gun and she's going to take your money. So, but uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I get a kick out of it and uh, John's expressed a good deal of interest in it, but I just, you know, you, you just don't, you know, it doesn't come with the gun. It's not part of the, package you get it in so it's something you have to you know uh certainly have an interest in doing you know some guys i know uh just that is not their thing and then other guys uh, well how do you do that i'd like to learn and uh you know it's it's one it seems to be one or the other I, it is for me and i think it probably is for you too why wouldn't you spend a six guy <laughs> you know if yeah yeah we talk about that all the time and and i mentioned it being the fidget spinner um of the yeah. old west but for the most part uh in my group i'm the only one who does any real real spinning at all and all i really do is to like you saw in the video i'll spin it back in the holster after i if i don't die let me preface that with the fact is that i die a lot and you probably all know that if i don't die i get the great honor of being able to spin my gun back in my holster which is very rare because i dirty dirty dan kills me a lot and so does arizona red they shoot me but anyway it's enough about me it's it's yeah, yeah. It's, it's a flashy thing and i think that that is another thing that people look at it and go wow that's cool i want to learn how to do that i want to yeah, do that it is and 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 like I said, here's the deal. Now I'm Jesse James. We always win, and we shoot the sheriff. And so, you know, but do you shoot the deputy? Do. You knew that was yeah. coming. You knew if it. There, if, if there you is know. one, we shoot him. <laughs> okay. And sometimes there is, but sometimes there's. And and Marshall Milford did hit the ground last week, which was pretty amazing. And I told him, "You're going to be up on purpose." So yeah. Did he get hurt or was it okay? No, oh, he didn't. He said he was working on that Golden Globe thing and he decided to, you know, hit the ground. <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah, it is something that uh, that I can do. And it just, uh, it's just a little more pizzazz is really what it amounts to. So, 
I get a kick out of it. A lot of people say, uh, how long did it take you to learn that? Or you've been doing that long or <laughs> so. Yeah, well, that's good. I mean, you know, it, it opens the door for the conversation and hopefully somebody will be interested and want to join up. You know, that's really what it comes down to. Um, I, I have this theory that in nothing, I'm not trying to slight living history because living history is ultimately so important to this hobby. But um, in living history, you walk into a town and there's a blacksmith and there's a lady making dresses and there's people who are doing daily chores, which is what you saw 90% of on the West. It's not like you walk, you got off the stagecoach in the West and there was 16 gunfights going on, you know, um, uh, you into the, maybe only 15. The, or you walk into the Long Branch Saloon and everybody's carrying a gun. That really <laughs> right. didn't happen either, so... Right. And Sam, the bartender was never armed, was he? <laughs> exactly. So. Right. And neither was Miss Kitty. No, she may have had something tucked in her garter bills or something. Uh, I don't think so. Maybe she did. I don't know. But, um, you know, there's nothing sliding the living history, folks, because that's important. And I think that's where that's the difference. I think you can categorize us, right? You got the gunfight shows, you got the reenactors, and then you got the living history people. I think you can literally put us into categories. And I think all of us do can do any, any amount of it. Uh, it's yeah. matters. Depends on yeah. what you're doing. It depends on the venue, maybe, you know? Well, in your case, you, you go to different places and do different various competitions. Say so you'll go to Prescott, you'll go to, well, just some other Phoenix forever. We're in one place all the time. Now, that has its, its positives and negatives. But the thing that I do, just because I just want to do it, I don't want to wear the same costume every Saturday. Now, I could, uh, if, if I were in your position, if I needed to be a townsman or if I needed to be a cowboy or if I needed to be a, a gunfighter or, a, you know, a bad guy, then I would then I would probably have those, uh, though that little bit more of a wardrobe than I have now, only because I'm not that diversified. I'm simply, I'm doing the vest, the hat, the boots, the gun, the leather. I can make it, I can dress it up or I can dress it down. But I do not have like what you have is a, a townsman outfit with a, with a sack, well, with a sack coat and, uh, or, you know, something like that. But, but that's not necessary for the part that you play. You know, if, no, if you not. decided at one point to do a movie and somebody said, hey, listen, we need you to be the banker, then yeah, you you, you keep your puff tie in your vest, but you're probably gonna have to get a different coat, you know, sure. maybe a different hat, but that's neither <laughs> yeah. here nor there. I mean, when you, when you do a group like, yeah, like you said, we do these competitions, we go around, we do shows and we all, it's like a repertory company. We all play different parts. Um, and so, yeah, you have a lot of different costumes. Uh, I, quite frankly, somebody asked me the other day, quite frankly, I don't like to dress in a townie outfit. I don't. I, I don't mind it, but it's not my my first choice. I'd rather be where the action is. Sure, sure. Well, that's what I mean. And and like I said, I'm just pointing out that, pointing out that those are the difference between what you do and what I do. And, and in, in many ways, it'd be kind of fun to kind of branch out and, and you know, doing what you are not in a position to have. You know, I'm, I'm sure you'd wish you had, a, you know, maybe a Saturday train to rob every Saturday. Oh, and I do. I, Absolutely. I feel like I, I feel like, and, and really, truthfully, I guess it puts me kind of in a in a pretty good position because I can, you know, where else can a man my age dress up like his favorite TV Western and movie Western guy and shoot, shoot blanks at people. Yeah, that's great. Right. No, I think I think that um, that's one of the reasons why I have you on a lot is because you are actively doing this. In fact, if you if you probably added up all the time you spent doing the shows, you probably have more experience doing shows than I do. Oh, um, yeah. This because you're doing it every Saturday. I mean, even well, even with coronavirus, you guys were out there doing shows. We did it. You just pulled your bandanas up, didn't you? <laughs> Kidding. Well, I'll, speak, I'll, I'll speak to that because. You know, coronavirus did, did coronavirus did slow us down. We, we, we stopped out for I think a couple of months, I think, and we began finally back in uh, instead uh, we we began in April. We we 
stopped the show in May, at the top of May, and didn't go back to it until the probably second week of July. So we were out, you know, a month and a half or so. But it did slow us down, and it slowed the crowd down. And of course, I ended up with the, with the COVID, and so my wife, uh, we were out. Uh, as far as I know, I was the only one of the group that, that was touched by it. But uh, yeah, it's it's. But still, people showed up. Now this year was a big. Oh, we're, we can get back up in it again, and so yeah, it's, it's starting at the. Easter weekend of April, we were right back in it and really haven't taken a break since. So, um, you know, yeah, it, it remains a popular attraction for those outside the area that want to come see us. So. Yeah, that's um, that's cool. And I, and I know the people you were telling me that as soon as the restrictions were lifted, people were very excited to get out. And I think that's what's going on here is that people are looking for events. Um, when I went to that Wyatt Earp event, it was a bigger turnout than I thought it was going to be because I, we were still, I think we were right at the tail end of taking the masks off, you know, but uh, there were a lot of people out there that just said, you know, I'm ready. I want to go out and I want to do stuff. Um, they want to enjoy themselves and there's nothing like, <laughs> maybe some of you can't, uh, hopefully everybody watching this live stream right now can, can attest to this. There's nothing like watching a gunfight. I mean, as weird as that sounds, uh, it's, I think it's always fun. Even if it's not a great gunfight performance, it's still fun because you get the ultimate, you get the ending, you get to smell the smoke, you get to hear the blast, you get to see the guy fly off of his boots, out of his boots, next to his boots. Well, maybe you know, he still has his boots on, I don't know, but. You know, as I said, we used to go through two, two, uh, two cylinders full. We go through about ten rounds uh, if you loaded five in each um, every every show. But we kind of concluded that since we're since the, due to the scarcity of powder and primers and things to reload them, and uh, there for a little bit there was even a scarcity of blanks because the blank manufacturers that I would find from and then Dave was began to buy from uh had run out well john was instrumental in finding another guy who, who made it so i bought some because i couldn't find any more black powder it wasn't readily available as i thought i could get it i'm, I'm not out of black powder i'm not out of primers but i didn't want to be, be in a position that i was using up my supply using my using up what i'd stored up but um at any rate um so we're going through half the gunfire we typically would go through but let me tell you when you're shooting when you're shooting this old west stuff and it, it generates a lot of smoke and a lot of a lot of flame and and it's you it, don't it's, say <laughs> do what i said you don't say I do. it creates a lot of smoke sorry I do. <laughs> oh. people people love it um I think um, I, my recollection is that there's somebody, whenever we go to Prescott, there's somebody, when we're walking away, some other group shoots off a shotgun and it sounds like a howitzer. I mean, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what they're loading in that shotgun, um, but it literally like you shrink when you hear it. And the audiences, you can just hear them giggling and laughing and they love it. It scares them. It's loud. They see a lot of smoke. You can see the plume of smoke go up in the air. They love it. It's it's uh, it represents that whole action thing that we think of, you know. Now, now let me ask you something because I, and I, I, we, you've remarked about it several times, but now you use uh, probably a couple of different revolvers depending on the character you're portraying. But now, and tell me about that. But also about the the load you use as far as your your blanks go. Do you? Uh, just, are some of your blanks a little less than others, or are they all about the same? No, they're all the same. It's the same load that I've shared with you and the, the other members uh, who have watched the blank making video from the first year, which I'm going to update. The shotgun blanks, however, um, Dirty Dan walked off set just three months ago and said to me, uh, not enough powder. So 
and then he handed the shotgun to me um, after scaring half the people in the audience. So I guess he wants to scare everybody in the audience, but I think maybe I'll revise that shotgun shell video and add brass shells to it as well, because those are pretty cool. And I, I've, I've, uh, I've gotten some of those. I think I sent you some too, but yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think we all, we all just use the same rounds. It's well, different. It's different with us because there's one guy, and in my case, it's me, who's the armorer, uh, who has all the blanks. Uh, in your case, Milford has blanks. You have other blanks that you make because you can do it cheaper and probably more reliable. Uh, some of the other guys either buy their blanks or they get Milford's blanks. So you have a, a hodgepodge of blank sources going on there, whereas we have all one source, which at this point is me. Well, you know, honestly, it'd be cheaper. Milford was just given to me. That'd be cheap as they could get. <laughs> but anyway. If you give them to you? Oh, uh, yeah. 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 He, he just hands them out like can't, like chicklets. So, <laughs> <laughs> but we, we, we did the math on this, and we figured out that those crimped blanks are costing about, what, 50 to a dollar a round, aren't they? Well, they're not quite that high, actually. They're not. What would you but, say they are? But but I guess when you calculate shipping in and everything like that, it can be really expensive. So the re recycled brass idea and the black powder and the floral foam is really a money saver. There's no oh, yeah, definitely cheaper. Uh, plus I plus I just hate to see them go through waste brass because I mean that, other than giving them away, you just really can't. You, there's nothing else to do with them um, except turn them into a recycling center and. Uh, have their way with it and then someone else is getting the money for that you aren't right. but uh but at any rate uh, now the reason i ask about your guns now some guns you use for different portrayals what what are some of the different guns you use I well i thought i was supposed to be asking the questions okay anyway i have a uh this one that you've seen this is my my overall uh gun that i use for a lot of different roles i have a ruger vaquero it's stainless with elk horn grips that I use for shows where I cannot afford to not be able to shoot. I'll explain that in a second. Um, and then I also have an open top, which you've seen in some videos, which is basically um, a pre it's a cartridge firearm that, that Colt came out with prior to this one, the year prior, 1872, 1871, 1872, they manufactured with old, parts from um, a percussion firearms and they made a cartridge firearm. I love it. It's terrific. But that is also in the same category as this. I have to be careful where I shoot it because if you get a backed out primer, which you do with either store-bought blanks or homemade blanks, if you get a backed out primer, that primer will push against the, the frame of the gun and stop the cylinder from rotating. Um, my Ruger doesn't care. My Ruger says, ha, ha, ha child's play and then i can cock that hammer back and continue to fire um my open top locks up and says i'm done i'm moving to california uh i'm i'm retiring and this gun right here says i don't know what to do so it depends on what i'm doing you know what i mean recently i was in a movie and i used the open top because i thought it'd be cool everybody was having backed out primers and mine was, I was constantly having to remove my cylinder to replace, to replace the blanks out. Because, so yeah. yeah, if I had brought my Ruger, everything would have been fine. Anyway, huh. that's the story. Now, my, the, 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 the stainless guns I have evidently have extremely close tolerances. Uh, this is uh, the uh, Pretty. stainless, stainless uh, Frontier Pieta. And it's a beautiful gun, and I polished it up with mother's wheel polish. <laughs> Took any, and it really worked very, very well. It looks, it looks every bit of nickel, but the tolerances it on does. this is very extreme. However, this is a, another Taylor, another Pieta, only Taylor's and Company, and this is the one you talked about the uh, reversed engraving, uh, laser engraving is what it is. And the tolerances on this gun are not identical to the one I just showed you. This gun has never hung up on on any on none any backed out primer, not one bit. 
I don't, you know, and normally primers don't back out that far, but I'm simply saying that this gun is never hung up. While that one I showed you just a moment ago, I mean, uh, it's just, if I want to fire this gun, I've got to modify the flash hole and not to mention the, the, the actual, the radius around where the primer actually fits in the pocket there uh, so that so that it doesn't uh, it does not back out because on those guns right on these so, guns they lock up the gun and like you say without having that plunger here and then to pull out the pull out the yeah. film stand you're in trouble you're done yeah on that movie i was just talking about i you know my open top has i have to it actually is it's an older model so i actually have to take a wedge out to remove the barrel to take the cylinder out and so every time we would do a take, I would have to go back and take the whole gun apart and put it back together. Hurry up, well, hurry up, hurry up. And that's and that's what Dave bought. If he likes that work, it will be okay. But you know. and, that's, and that's what our new new guy Dave bought. You know, I say he's been there two years, but our new guy Dave, uh, he bought a gun just like that. And it's got the wedge in it from this uh, cap and ball pistol days because that's the way Colt made them. You know, that's just, they were a two-piece not a solid frame there was a there was a bottom half or back half of the frame and the front half of that frame that held on by the wedge and the arbor of the cylinder uh is the other half of it and like you say if you have a primer back out against that frame in the back by the hammer well it's wedge pulling time so um yeah I just got a question from rich white who asked if you got the Taylor and company with their with their trigger job didn't you send yours to um, Bob James, or did it come with the trigger job already? You well, know? I, I, they, if it, if it, I don't know if it, mine didn't come with anything that I ever knew of. But the, the Taylors and Company, the Outlaw Legacy here, which, which this is, it says Outlaw Legacy here on the back strap. Uh, so you probably can't see it, but uh, no. Anyway, um, Oh, why would they put that on the back strap? Uh, there, there is a you know that the action on the gun has been has been tuned by Bob James. I, I, I factory a factory tuning job is pretty fair. In fact, these stainless models were uh, had a selling point on the idea that it had a factory tune job, and sure enough, but it's not a competition fast draw tune job. Okay, you can probably shoot, probably shoot successfully with uh, uh, on um, uh, cowboy action shooting without a problem. But if you're really doing uh, doing a, a fast draw work, then it needs to be modified by a pro. So, right? No, I understand. Yeah, I think. Um... You know, I've, I've talked to reenactors who have said, oh, well, my my primers never back out. And then um, I've talked to reenactors who say that my primers back out 50 percent of the time. Um, one of the reasons I want to redo the video is because I want to uh, illustrate the fact that I, I think that Mitch has helped me a lot because he took our recipe and has been using it for a couple of years now. And. I suddenly realized the reason my primers are backing up because my prime my my blanks were old, um, and I don't know if I said this in the first video, but the floral foam or something starts to degrade after a while, and I think you you it causes a lot of primer backouts because since I've added fresh floral foam to my blanks, everything works fine. I have a feeling that Mitch's way to do it, which is I basically to load every weekend before you go out there. He makes a fresh set of blanks. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. I think that's the way to do it. I think you don't let your blanks sit in a box for a year because I think that floral foam, you can see it. That floral foam, when exposed to air, turns from green to dark green. Yeah. That tells me something, right? It tells you something's going on with it. It's degrading or something, yeah, right? And the brass, actually, I know that I had some old store bought blanks factory made blanks and i had them in a plastic bag in a baggie in my duffel bag and my you know that i take the train every saturday and you know what i, I kind of forgot about them and and i didn't because i went to the making my own 
And I left them in there. I got them out one day and I thought, oh my God, look at these things. And you know, here's the thing. Those brass, th that brass is simply going to tarnish and it's simply going to oxidize. And it's not going to oxidize just outside, but it's going to oxidize inside as well. So, um, you know, I, 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 and I, I passed it on to John and Dave. I said, look, I said, when you guys show up here on Saturday, don't don't bring your box of that you got from from the manufacturer in with you. Don't put that in your bag. You bring in what you know, ten or twelve rounds that you want to shoot that day, and leave the rest at home because I guarantee you what's going to happen. Same thing that happened to me is I put a bunch of them in a bag, and by the end of the season, when I got down to the bottom of the bag, there's a bunch of powder down at the bottom of that bag. Right. Because <laughs> the cramp brass simply isn't uh, is not a uh, there's no glue in it. There's no cap to it. There's no cardboard. Right. So that triple FP powder is creeping out of those cases. Right. Yeah. There's a, you know, the, the Civil War people use uh, cream of wheat. Some of them, I don't know if they still use that anymore. I've heard of cardboard in there for people. I think the, the story that I told about the guy that shot the balloons out of my hand he was far enough away that something was coming out of that gun. So I'm assuming it was probably cardboard. Uh, I don't know for sure, but uh, um, he was at least 15 to 20 feet away from me. There's no way the black powder would have burst that balloon and not hit me as well. Well, here's the thing. Just so you know, I had a guy come on the train one day and he wanted to sell the crimp brass to us as blanks because he was making them for the horseback mounted uh, shooters. Oh, okay. And that's what shoots the balloons that they're riding around and drawing the guns and shooting them. So that's breaking the balloon there. Now they're getting pretty close. You know, yeah. certainly closer than we they, are. They're definitely people. closer. If you look at pictures of those, those guys are less than 10 feet away from those balloons. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're, sure. they're almost, they can't miss except for the fact that they're on a running horse. So yeah. <laughs> that's, that's all. That be, that's, that that's, all right. That's that's weaving in and out of cones and such, though. So, yeah, it's definitely difficult. I'm not saying it's easy. And those of you who do it, my hat's off to you. Uh, but but yeah, they're closer than we are. Yes, one, one of the reasons why I think they made the Montado that gun, that one gun with the lower hammer. That's why. It's, yeah, it's the horseback. And the Alpha or something or some of those. I think those. Are, that's why they did those. It's, it basically, I guess, before the Stroker came out, the Stroker hammers uh, with the yeah. redone radiuses, uh, they they lowered the hammer like a Bisley and uh, made it easier to get to the hammer without having to reach up to the top of the frame to get it. So, yeah. which is a pretty cool idea. They're outlawed in, in fast draw. You can't have those, but, but you can see why. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah, I, I can't think of anything else that we've covered. I like I said, I oh the black the brass shotgun shells. So you mentioned the powder being at the bottom of the bag. Um, one of the problems with the shotgun shells that I was using prior was that I was taking real shotgun shells, uh, cutting them down and emptying the contents out and filling them with floral foam and powder. The problem is those are plastic, and when you cut them, they start to lose their integrity. Maybe that's the word. They become bouncy, you know, like plastic straws. They're squishy. So the powder, right, flexible. That's the better word, squishy, squishy, flexible, whatever. Um, the powder falls out. So somebody said, well, get the brass shotgun shells. And I bought some from Magtech. And I sent you a couple of them. And they are amazing because they don't do that, obviously. And you can reload them. So really? I will be doing an updated video on that at some point. Well, now, one thing, uh, Milbert, uh, Milford makes shot 12 gauge uh, sh shells for uh, Richard. Uh, oh, what does he make them out of? Do you know? Well, they're actually, he actually takes, uh, he buys the, he buys the cheap rounds at the store. The, uh, I can't remember. Uh, I don't really use them myself, so I don't know much about them. I just know that what he does with those is exactly what he does with the, uh, his blanks that he makes. Now, what he does, you can store his for a year, and they will, and they will not change one bit, because what he does to his 
Yeah, he puts a, he puts glue on the top of his. So okay. his his are his are a sealed blank with uh, with with glue and a, and a piece of uh, cardboard, I think, or something. So he got some kind of wadding in there that he puts glue on top of, I think. But I know he's got glue on it because I've I've seen every one of them. And they're and they're and they're all Pyrodex blanks, which are which are perfectly fine. That that most of that most of the if not all that I've ever seen of the crimped black, uh, brass blanks are Pyrodex uh, powered. None of them typically are black power powder. Um, I like the black powder personally because it's 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 got a different sound to it, and it's got I don't know maybe a little more smoke to it, but it's certainly doesn't have that little bit of a crack. It's got more of a boom or a thud to it, which I immediately right. recognized from my old Remington uh, black powder gun days when I first bought a revolver uh, black powder gun. So. A uh, question just came up about when did plastic shotgun shells first appear? Um, I can't remember. I think it was around the turn of the century. It might've been a little bit before. Prior to that, they had brass and they had paper shotgun shells. Paper was a big deal. Um, but no, I don't know. I can't remember about the, the plastic one. Sorry, I'll have to look that up. The news um, of the movie, you know, the movie with Tom um, Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks movie, News of the World. They have brass shotgun shells in there. Yeah, now, a lot of uh, there's a there's a reenactorism, which is a term I, that I a friend of mine. Dave, can you hear me? You can't hear me. So can anybody, can anybody but I, ha, I noticed uh, I noticed on that movie that they had brass uh, shot shells uh, for the shotgun uh, and the way they used it. And uh, I think in the in the movie about Billy the Kid, where Billy shoots the guy with a load of dimes, uh, is they played on that and they used that device in this movie because he would collect dimes. Uh, he would people would pay a dime to. Uh, listen to him read the news of the world traveling through their town. Yeah. And, uh, the little girl, as they were facing these uh, uh, high women uh, in the middle of the uh, middle of the uh, desert out there or the rocks and things, uh, she loaded up with dimes. And right. that's how they dispatched so, the bad guys. So, so there's, can you all hear me now? I think somebody, can you hear me, Mitch? Can you hear me? You can't hear me. All right. I'm going to talk anyway, because I think other people can hear me. Um, from what I understand, the whole dimes thing with Billy the Kid may or may not have actually happened. Mythbusters did a thing on dimes saying that if you, they fired it and found out that all the dimes did was bounce off the person, really. They did maybe broke the skin. So I'm not 100% sure the dimes thing is legitimate. I think that they would have had a better chance with rocks or shells or something like that, or just a bunch of dirt. So I'm not really sure, but. Can you hear me yet at all? No? All right. Can you all, you can, somebody, people can hear us both. Mitch, I'm going to actually cancel the live stream at this point because I think that we're done. Hold on a sec. One minute. I know. Next time we do this, let's have a picture drawing of our faces and put our mouths in there where the mouth is like clutch cargo. And we can uh, do that kind of thing. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool, huh? Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, y'all. Thanks so much for coming. We'll do another one of these in the future, I hope, okay? All right. Bye-bye now. Thanks for having me, Santee. You got it. Anytime.